الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So uh, the next thing that uh, so after proving so in the previous lessons we looked at the existence of Allah subhanahu wa taala the proof of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa taala. In this lesson we're looking at the proof we're going to start the proofs of the privative attributes sifat salbiya which are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's <coughs> beginninglessness, endlessness, difference from creating things, independence and oneness. Um, beginning with, and so this in this lesson, we're going to do his beginninglessness and his endlessness, his qidam and his baqa. So uh, the way, uh, so remember that there are two arguments. There's the argument for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from contingency, and there is the argument for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the fact that the universe began to exist. So um, remember also that, the, that what this argument is saying is that the universe is dependent and since it's dependent and needy, it needs someone to give it something, right? So, and the one who gave it the thing that it needs cannot have that dependence. This is the argument, basically. So if so, so now, now uh, the mutakallimun, they they start with one of two kinds of dependencies. You can either say that the universe is dependent because it's contingent. If it's dependent because it's contingent, that means that every statement that you make about the universe, you say the sky is blue, you say that um, uh, that apples fall down, any statement that you make is contingent. And this contingency, this is its dependency. And the one who uh, who made all of these contingent facts true does not have that dependency. And so the one who, uh, uh, from the argument from contingency, the conclusion of the argument from contingency is that there exists someone who is not contingent. There exists someone who exists necessarily. That's the conclusion of the argument of contingency. So the argument from contingency proves the argument from contingency proves the existence of a necessary being. Okay. The argument from the fact that the universe began to exist proves the existence of a being that didn't begin to exist. Because if you're, if you, uh, that did not begin, in other words, that is beginningless. So the, so the dependency that we begin with from the argument from contingency is contingency. And so the being whose existence we prove is someone who is not characterized by contingency. The dependency with which you begin from the argument, in the argument, from the fact that the universe began to exist, is the fact that it began to exist. So the fact that the universe began to exist means that it needs someone to make it exist. And that's what Imam al-Sanusi, he spent some time uh, demonstrating that. Because that's, the, that's, that's an important part of this argument, that the universe is dependent because it began to exist. And if it began to exist, it needs, to, it needs something to make it exist. And he, and he told you, he gave you some reasons why, and we saw that maybe it's non-inferential. Um, so the conclusion of the argument from the fact that the universe began to exist is that it was the one who made it exist did not begin to exist. And now there are two different things. So one is going to lead to another. One of each one is going to lead to another. So you can go fr that from the fact that something exists necessarily, you can infer that, it's, that it didn't begin to exist. And we're going to see that from the fact that something did not begin to exist, you can, you can infer that it exists necessarily. That's, this is the path. So in the, in the Sanusiya, uh, the path that the author, uh, the author takes, because he uh, argues from the fact that the universe began to exist, he takes... Uh, yeah, he takes this path. It goes like this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the argument for the fact 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not begin to exist. And then from there we're going to we're going to go to the fact that he didn't that he his existence never comes to an end and when we get there we've gotten here. We've gotten to the fact that he exists necessarily. This is what we're doing. So let's look at what he says. So he says that وَأَمَّا بُرْهَانُ وُجُوبِ الْقِدَمِ لَهُ تَعَالَى فَلِأَنَّهُ لَوْ لَمْ يَكُنْ قَدِيمًا لَكَانَ حَادِثًا He says the demonstrative argument for the necessary predication of beginninglessness to Allah Most High is that if He were not beginningless, He would not have begun to exist. So again, I want you to note the translation. Okay, you won't... Uh, you won't uh, this is so there is a uh, the the way that the the way that it's translated is very significant other translations they don't translate like this that uh, what is it what, what the, uh, so the translation here is that the demonstrative argument for the necessary predication of beginningless burhanu wujub al qidami lahu ta'ala so what what are we saying here what we are saying here is that what we are proving is that the statement Allah Most High is beginningless. In Arabic we say Qadim. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is beginningless. Allahu Qadim. We're saying that this statement, we're not just saying it's true. We're saying it's true necessarily. And we're, we're saying it's true necessarily. Now, uh, if you go back and you look at the, the, the Sanusiyah, uh, um, he says the demonstrative argument for Allah Most High's existence. He doesn't say the necessary predication of existence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because this is the argument from the fact that the universe began to exist. So the fact that the universe began to exist, you begin by proving the existence of someone who made the universe. And you don't know yet that he exists necessarily. From there, where do you go? From there, you go to the fact that 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 uh, the predication of beginninglessness to him is necessary. So here, so he says, Burhanu wujub al qidam. It wasn't Burhanu wujub al wujud. It was Burhanu al wujud. Over here, it's Burhanu wujub al qidam. What does wujub al qidam mean? It means the necessary predication of beginninglessness to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That's what we're proving here. So he says the demonstrative argument for the fact. For the necessary predication of beginninglessness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that if he were not beginningless, he would have begun to exist. So, uh, so uh, okay, so it goes like this. So let's actually uh, switch the page a little bit. Switch the page, go here. So, here's the syllogism the major premise if Allah Most High were not beginningless then he would be he would have begun to exist so there's an if then statement if he were not beginningless then he would have begun to exist now so what, what's the next step going to be? This is the antecedent, this is the consequent. The next step of the reasoning, we're going to, s we're going to prove that it's not possible for Allah to have begun to exist. We're going to prove this. We're going to say that with the minor premise is, minor premise is, but um, it is impossible for Allah Most High to have begun to exist. So we're saying that the consequent is false. And that means that the antecedent is false as well. And that means that the conclusion is, therefore, uh, uh, Allah Most High is beginningless. This is, the, this is the larger structure of the argument. And what he's now going to do here is, he's going to prove the minor premise. It's not possible for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to have begun to exist. Why is it? that it's not possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have begun to exist, that's what he is explaining over here. He's explaining, he is proving the minor premise of this logical syllogism. So let's put this to a side. 
look at this. So he says that uh, he says that uh, if Allah if Allah subhanahu wa taala began to exist, then this would entail that He needs someone to make Him exist. So let's say that this is the universe. The universe is everything apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say this is the universe. And the universe began to exist. So the universe began to exist. What we've just seen in the previous section uh, is that if something begins to exist, it needs someone to make it exist. So what we've proven in the previous section in the argument from the fact that the universe began to exist that the universe needs something to make it exist so now he is saying that that the one who made it exist cannot have begun to exist why not because if the one who made it exist also began to exist then he would need someone else to make him exist and then if that one began to exist, then he would need someone else to make him exist, and so on. Okay, so when, so the one who made the universe, or the ones, or, or if you go back, if the, the began to exist, then, uh, so if he began to, then, then he would need, need someone to make him exist. And then if, so we're going on the assumption that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not beginningless, in other words, what we're going on the assumption is that there is none in nowhere in this chain do you find someone who did not begin to exist. So if nowhere in this chain, if you don't find anywhere in this chain someone who did not begin to exist, then this is impossible because it leads to one of two things which are both impossible. What are the two things? He said this would then entail circularity or infinite regress. He says that if there is if this then if there's if this chain never ends at someone who did not begin to exist then it either leads to infinite regress let's do the second one first infinite regress means that this goes on uh, without end uh, uh, if it if it goes an infinite infinite regress is we've already seen it's not an explanation because there's nothing that removes the need you all you multiply the problem you postpone the question you multiply the problem so it leads to infinite so it, it either leads to infinite regress or it leads to, or, or what you can do is you can do circularity what circularity circularity is that you take it back uh, to the beginning circularity is you take it back to the beginning So you say that uh, this first one was caused by this, this was caused by this, this was caused by this, and this was then caused by the first one. So you make a circular chain. You can have a circular chain, chain of four, three, two, or even one. You make a circular chain of one is to say that something caused it is itself. Circularity is impossible. Why is it impossible? So let's take a circular chain of two. Let's say that that uh, that. Uh, the first caused the second, this caused this, and this caused this. This brought this into existence, this brought this into existence. This is impossible. Why? Because in order for the first to bring the second into existence, it needs to exist before it. But in, in order for the second to bring the first into existence, it needs to exist before it. Which is a contradiction. Either one exists before the other, or the other exists before the first. So, so, the, uh, so if, if, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not beginningless, then this leads either to an infinite chain or to circular or a circular chain of things that began to exist, which are both impossible because that does not give a sufficient reason for the existence of the universe which began to exist. So since it's impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have begun to exist, because if he began to exist, it would lead, lead to uh, infinite regress and circularity. Therefore, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beginningless. We know He's beginningless. He's not just actually beginningless, but He must be beginningless. He is necessarily beginningless. Why is He necessarily beginningless? Just wanted that. Man. 
We're not just saying that he's actually beginningless. We're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beginningless is necessarily true. Why is it necessarily true? Because it's impossible for him to have a beginning. He cannot have a beginning. If he had a beginning, then it would leave it's impossible. We've just shown that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a beginning is false necessarily, and therefore this is true necessarily. So it must be the case. It's not just actually the case, but it must be the case. This is the difference. This is the difference between scientific reasoning and uh, and uh, and reasoning uh, through the mind, which is what we're doing here. This is something that science cannot do. So scientific reasoning can can is is evidence for something that is actually the case. Sci scientific reasoning it leads you to the modality of something actually being the case or continually being the case. But scientific reasoning will never tell you if something is necessarily the case. That's why uh, science cannot, on its own, cannot prove the existence of God. Because science can never tell you that something is necessarily the case. For that, you need another kind of reasoning. You need the hukum aqli. You need, you need to use the mind. Um, and uh, mo uh, modal, modal reasoning in the way that I, I just described. This, you need this kind of reasoning and scientific reasoning is a part of, of human reasoning but it's not everything. Um, and uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. We now know that he is, uh, he did not begin to exist. He is beginningless and we know that this is necessarily the case. Okay, so now what we've done is we've proven uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beginningless. What we're going to do next is we're going to look at the fact that Allah is endless and that and from that we're going to come to the conclusion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a necessary being. So Imam al Sanusi he then uh, talks about the uh, now he examines the pr argument for the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endless is endless. So he says that wa amma burhan wujubil baqa ilahu ta'ala again note the uh, note the translation the demonstrative argument for the necessary predication of endlessness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are we doing here? What we're doing here is that we are saying that uh, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is endless. His existence does not come to an end. But we're not just proving the fact that this is actually true. We're proving the fact that this is true and that it's necessarily true. That it must be true. So the, what the burhan for the wujub of baqa is the argument for the necessary predication of endlessness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the burhan of this? He says that if it were possible for him to stop existing, then he would not be beginningless. So, uh, okay, so, uh, so, okay, so let's, let's look at the argument. So, so it, what we are saying is that Allah is endless and that's the same thing as saying that that's the same thing as saying that it is impossible for Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stop existing so we're going to we're going to prove this the way we're going to prove this we're going to do proof by contradiction so we take the major premise the major premise is if it were possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stop existing then uh, he would not be beginningless so if it were possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stop existing then he would not be beginningless so this needs to be explained but let's say that it's true if this is true then the minor premise will be, we're going to deny the consequent, we're going to say, but uh, he is beginningless. Therefore, the conclusion is that it is, it is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stop existing, which is the same as Allah is endless. So that's the large structure. That's the larger structure of the argument. So the this argument, this argument hinges on the fact that hinges on the fact that uh, 
begin beginninglessness entails necessary existence. So if it's it, this argument is based on the fact that if someone is beginningless, then they exist necessarily. And we already we just proved that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beginningless. He did not begin to exist. So if we understand why someone's beginning uh, the beginningness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entails that he exists necessarily, then our uh, the conclusion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's endlessness follows naturally because if someone exists necessarily what does it mean they exist necessarily it means they cannot not exist if they cannot not exist that means they can't stop existing that means they there was the, they can't stop existing because they must exist so they're endless so necessary existence so this beginningless someone who is beginningless and endless necessarily this is just another way of saying that they exist necessarily because someone who exists necessarily it's it's not possible for them to not exist they ha they must exist that means that they can't have a beginning to their existence and they can't have an end to their existence so at the large larger level what are we doing remember this is we're, we're starting here from the fact that the universe began to exist so from the universe began to exist, we prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we don't prove the necessary existence. Then we prove that he didn't begin to exist, and from that we see that he exists necessarily, and from that we see that he cannot stop existing. So the key to this argument is all seeing that beginninglessness entails necessary existence. So let's go back to the, 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 this thing that if, if it were possible for Allah to stop existing, then he would not be beginningless. Then he would not be beginningless. Why? Because if it were possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to stop existing, then he wouldn't exist necessarily. Then he would be, he his existence would be contingent. Okay? So what we're saying here is, another way of saying this is that if, Allah's existence was not necessary, then he would not be beginningless, which is exactly what, we're, what I'm saying here. If Allah's existence was not necessary, then he would not be beginningless. But we've already proven that he's beginningless. Therefore, it's impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stop existing, which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, endless. So over here, this we would change this to be, therefore, it is impossible for, uh, for Allah Allah's existence to not be necessary. That's how you would make this change here. Uh, and that's what he's saying here. He's saying that why is it that if it were possible for him to stop existing, then he would not be beginningless? Because if it were possible for him to stop existing, then his existence would be contingent. His existence would not be necessary. And anything that exists contingently must have begun to exist. That's the opposite of this. So beginninglessness entails necessary existence. And contingent existence entails beginning. So let's, uh, let's, why is that? Okay, why is that? Well, let's do at a very, a very simple level. If someone is beginningless, that means, so someone, it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's beginningless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not begin to exist. Why? Because he doesn't need anyone to make him exist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need anyone to make him exist. Why? What does that mean? That means he exists necessarily. If, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not begin to exist, remember we have we had this uh, this chain of creators and we said the chain of creators can't go on forever and it has to end in someone who was not made to exist by anyone. So if, if someone is not made to exist by anyone, and they're Qadim, what we're saying is, they don't need to be made to exist. 
So if so, so beginninglessness is the same as saying that that Allah subhanahu wa taala exists necessarily, and if Allah subhanahu wa taala exists necessarily, then He cannot come to an end. So what we're actually basically what we're doing is we're saying we're saying that Allah exists and He exists necessarily, and His necessary existence is uh, and saying that Allah subhanahu wa taala is we're saying Allah subhanahu wa taala exists. And it is impossible for Allah to not exist. That's what these two attributes prove. They prove that it's not possible for Allah to not exist. And, uh, and Allah doesn't exist in time. But the way that we say this is that we say that His existence is neither preceded by non-existence nor succeeded by non-existence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't exist in time. So that's just, this is just something that we're, that we're saying. So uh, that's, what, that's what you're saying. So the demonstrative argument for the necessary predication of endlessness to Allah Most High is that if it were possible for him to stop existing then his existence would be contingent and he would not be beginningless why? because anyone who is beginningless must exist necessarily so he says because his existence would then be contingent not necessary and anything that exists contingently must have begun to exist so he actually so what he uh, so, so the, the opposite is also true what's the opposite? The opposite is that if someone is so beginninglessness entails if 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 some if someone if if someone does not have a beginning then they exist necessarily if they don't exist necessarily then they have a beginning that's that that's the opposite what happens what what does it mean that they don't exist necessarily what it means is that they uh, they they exist contingently so anything whose existence is contingent this entails that the person that that it be, that that uh, uh, that he began to exist. Anything that exists contingently began to exist. Why? Because if it didn't begin to exist, it would exist necessarily. So what this is this is actually so I'm gonna give there's other there's other evidences for this too. But you can actually what this shows is this is another this is one of the reasons why. The argue the philosopher were mistaken. Why Ibn Sina was mistaken? Because he he said that uh, the universe is contingent, yet it never began to exist. So we're th so this is a refutation. This is one refutation of the philosopher's position, because anything that exists contingently, it must have begun to exist. Because if it didn't begin to exist, it would exist necessarily. And so since we see the universe and we see that it's contingent we can immediately, we know that it began to exist. So wh now we're going back between contingency, conting contingency and beginning to exist. And the way what you need to remember is if you step back into the Quranic mode, then basically what we're saying is dependency. If the universe has a dependency, then it, uh, if, it needs, if it needs something, then it depends on someone that that someone cannot need anything. And you can go the route of beginning to exist, you can go the route of contingency. Whichever route you go, whichever route you go, you will end up at uh, someone who does not exist, who exists necessarily, and who didn't begin to exist. And he brought into existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala, this universe which exists contingently and was made to exist. It, w it was made to exist. It needs someone to make it exist, and it needs, and it is contingent. Um, so, so this is the, uh, and so he says that we've already explained that uh, that uh, we've we've already explained uh, otherwise, otherwise, i.e., that he didn't begin to exist in the aforementioned demonstrative argument for the necessity of his beginninglessness. Um, uh, so, uh, so contingency and hudus, imkan and hudus are two sides of the same coin, but so now what the the mutakallimun, the scholars of of this science. They ask a question. Okay, based on all of this, they ask a question. The question that they ask is, is the basis of the universe's dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala its contingency or is it the fact that it began to exist? So which one is primary? Which one is primary? 
is the f is the basis of the universe is uh, uh, dependence on Allah Most High its contingency, or is it the fact that it began to exist? And this is a question that the Mutakallimun discussed. It's an important philosophical theological question. I, I I won't go through the reasoning that they go through, but what the, the conclusion is basically that it's the contingency. The contingency is more fundamental. You can feel it because contingency is. Uh, so, the, so what this uh, this leads to, you might have heard of the position that uh, that the universe is being continuously recreated. Some mutakallimun held that position. The pe the mutakallimun who held that position were those who said that the basis of the universe's dependency on Allah subhanahu wa taala is the fact that it began to exist, and then they said that uh, that the universe is continuously dependent. And for that reason, they'll have other arguments, but at at a larger level, for that reason. They said that the universe is being continuously recreated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's some, there's some scientific evidence that that might be the case. Uh, however, however the, the most of the mutakallimun, they said that the universe, the basis of its dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is its contingency. And what this means is the universe does not need to be continuously recreated in order for it to be continuously dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And most later mutakallimun, they held that the universe, its existence persists. It's not continuously recreated. Now, this, th this, is not, this is a philosophical position. It's not a theological position. Whether or not the universe is continuously recreated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nothing to do with our aqidah. This, this, is, this has to do with reality. So scientific evidence might point to one, it might point to the other. But either way, whichever way you go, the universe is continuously dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because contingency is more fundamental. And most of the Muslims, they said that our everyday experience points to the fact that things persist. I experience the, the wall in front of me as persisting in its existence, not as it's being recreated. So, uh, so that's, the, that's what most of the Muslims said. But all of these things, they're open. This is whether or not the universe is continue, pops in and out of existence. This is a question of falsafa or now science. So you would look at scientific evidence for this. But the, 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 what's the basis? The basis of the universe's dependence is its imkan. Imkan is more fundamental. So that even if something does persist, it's con continuously dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at a, at a philosophical level, you can go between one and other, one and other seam seamlessly. So another way to say another way to see this, you can come at it many different ways. So you can say that if something exists contingently, it needs something to make it exist. That means it must have begun to exist, because if it didn't begin to exist, it wouldn't need anyone to make it exist. So um, and uh, you can say it many other ways. Um, but again, the important thing here is I, I'm, I'm mentioning many points, um, and uh, the important for now, if you just hear them once and understand them at a high level, but just the main thing is. You, you need to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists necessarily and this and that, and that this is uh, that uh, any uh, rational reflection on the universe leads one to that conclusion that's what we've proved so far we've proved that Allah exists and that he exists necessarily and then in the next uh, lesson we'll look at some of his the other uh, the next two privative attributes and then in the next lesson we'll look at his oneness inshallah wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam